Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening and welcome back to the path pointing all towards heaven. Welcome to the Bible study discipleship program here at Set the Captives Free Outreach Center, where we are giving back what we owe, breaking chains around the world, and whole is our goal. Good evening. We are so happy that you are here with us tonight. We pray that you are blessed and highly favored and experiencing all that God has for you and that he is also getting all that he can get out of your life. This is session number three for the year 2023, and we are excited to be in week number two. Now, if you have properly registered for this class, you are able to go on and download the PowerPoints each week and follow along with me, take notes and build your Bible study portfolio, amen. Putting all the different classes that you've learned from in there, keeping notes that I promise you'll go back to and read over and over again. Glory to God. And so this is week number two. If you properly registered, you are reading from the same PowerPoint that I am. If not, you still should be able tonight, which will be the last night, to get in there, register, put your name and your information and start a Bible study account so that you can regularly learn with us. The link is right there on your screen. And if you are not a uh, Set the Captives Free member and you're visiting with us, please type visitor in the chat. Also, if you are here for the very first time, go on and type first time in the chat just so we can show you some love and let you know that we are very glad that you are here. All right, as we do every week, every class, a hundred likes, a hundred shares. So go on, take a moment. I'm going to pause while you take a moment to like this video in uh, beforehand, like this class, and then also share it to your page and other pages where it's going to really be a blessing to others. All righty, so by the end of class, we know that we will have our 100 likes and our 100 shares, so thank you in advance. And if you did that, go on and put shared in the chat or liked and shared in the chat. All righty, all right. So here is the 13-week course description. This is a 13-week course on how to stay strong spiritually. We will study the spiritual disciplines that make us strong. The practical, the practice, I'm sorry, of spiritual disciplines for personal spiritual growth include Bible study, prayer, meditation, fasting, singing, and fellowship. I'll read them again. Bible study, prayer, meditation, fasting, singing, and fellowship. These are the six spiritual disciplines that we're going to address in this 13-week course that help us stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, somebody type latter times, that's where we are, some shall depart the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We are now in that time. 
We are in a time where people are hungry, thirsty, looking for truth and running after it in many different directions. Some of them are running to the Lord and finding what they need. And some are running to uh, counterfeits, right? And replacements for the real thing. And they're not finding the joy, the love, the peace, the satisfaction that comes when you allow yourself to have a relationship with the Lord and a walk with the Holy Spirit. And so we are in that time and even some who have experienced God for real are giving heed to seducing spirits. They're changing their whole doctrine. They're going in a whole different direction, just totally misguided and pulled off track by the seducing spirits of the end time. And so we want to be careful and watch out for that and understand that it's already been prophesied that in the latter times, people will begin to do that. Somebody type, the devil will not get me. Somebody type it, the devil will not get me. That's a declaration you have to make over your life because even people who used to be grounded and solid in God are doing real funny stuff right now. So you don't want to be caught up in that. Amen. You want to stay on a firm foundation. So this course is designed to help you and I stay strong in this dark hour because we are in a time of gross darkness and we want to make sure that we are clear and hear the Lord's voice clearly. The purpose of this course is to help you develop the spiritual disciplines that will cause you to stay strong and solid in the faith. We must take intentional steps to renew our mind and to develop a lifestyle of prayer, praise, and worship. These disciplines will cause you to stand. Spiritual disciplines are those practices found in scripture that promote spiritual growth among believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we are believers in Jesus Christ. We believe that he died and rose again for our sins and that he's coming back again to bring us to himself. The spiritual disciplines are habits of devotion, habits of experiential Christianity that have been practiced by God's people since biblical times. Now, these are the things that you will come to do or do better as a result of this class, because some of these things you are doing already, but as a result of this class, you'll be more conscious of what it is you need to do and more intentional. So number one, we're gonna understand what spiritual disciplines are and use them. Secondly, we're gonna understand the power of habits. Habits are a very powerful thing. We're gonna develop a lifestyle of daily prayer. Some of you may already have that. This will just strengthen you in that area. We're also going to develop a lifestyle of devotion to God, of devotion, of strong attachment. Amen. And we're going to be committed to enhancing our faith by diligently and regularly seeking God. These are the objectives of this 13-week class. This is what we're looking to happen in your lives. So now let's look at it on a week-to-week -week basis. Last week was an introduction to spiritual maintenance and building a life of devotion. It was just an introduction to the course. Week number two, which is tonight, we're going to look at the discipline of Bible study. Why is that so important? Next week, we're going to look at the discipline of prayer. After that, we'll spend two weeks on the discipline of meditation. Week number six, the discipline of fasting. Week number seven, the discipline of fasting again. Week numbers eight and nine, the discipline of singing. I bet you never thought singing was a spiritual discipline, but we'll talk about that and the power that music has on our spirits. 
And then the discipline of fellowship, of spending time with other believers, highly important. And then uh, the 12th week, we're going to develop a personal devotion plan. And then, of course, before you know it, as with each each uh, session this year, we'll end up at week 13 saying, I can't believe we're in class number 13 already. Now, the difference in getting to cl uh, week number 13 this session is that, listen, guys, we'll be at the end of the year. This year just started. Oh my God. But we'll be at the end of the year. Can you believe that? Who somebody type is hard to believe. This year has is flying by so quickly. But that's where we are. Amen. All righty. Before we get into our lesson, I want to give you an opportunity to give. All of your giving is tax deductible. We are a 501c3 organization, amen. And so you may go right on and give. When you do, especially if you're a visitor, please make sure that you put your first and last name so that when we do the tax statements in January, you will have, you will have credit for your giving. All righty, because all of your giving to religious organizations is tax deductible, and we want to make sure that you have accurate records. So, Father, thank you in advance for the generosity of your people. I thank you tonight that everybody on here will at least give five or ten dollars to the mission of your work, and we just thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll tell you, our food pantry will appreciate all of your generosity. I, um, If you look on my Facebook page, my personal one, I pulled up the other day and the line to our food pantry was all the way past Burlington Coast, uh, Burlington store, which is our, our neighbor at the mall, all the way back there. The need is great. And so whatever you give will be appreciated. So our foundational scripture it's 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is one of them. In verse 7, it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And so basically what the apostle was saying here is don't sit around with a bunch of vain talk and, and, and things that do not edify. Instead, exercise yourself unto godliness, because godliness, of course, uh, is profitable. So here's some key terms when we say discipline. We're talking about uh, activity, exercise, or a regimen that develops or improves a skill. It's training. And so the Bible tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That word regimen there's a, a powerful synonym for that word, and it is routine. So it's a routine that you do that get, that keeps you strong. You with me? Uh, athletes have routines. Coco didn't win because she just got up there and just kind of hit the ball. She had routines that prepared her to function under that kind of pressure to function against a worthy opponent. And so the routines and regimens that she did have us now getting Serena part two. It's just so wonderful. But in every walk of life, one must discipline their self. You have to train yourself to stick to a course. Anyone that's ever finished college, finished trade school, completed anything, finished something, you had trained yourself and disciplined yourself and taught yourself how to stick to it. And so when we talk about spiritual maintenance, we're really talking about disciplining yourself so that you stick to what you have learned. Amen? All right. And devotion, when we talk about devotion to God, we're talking about profound dedication consecration, and here's my favorite, an earnest attachment to a cause 
or a person. So one who is devoted to something, they're earnestly attached. That doesn't mean a soft connection. It means a bond. It means an intentional gripping. And so somebody type, I am devoted to God, meaning you are earnestly, diligently attached to him. Hallelujah. Go on and type it. I am devoted to God. That's my declaration tonight. Amen. I am devoted to God. I am earnestly attached to him. And so I am disciplining myself to do my spiritual maintenance so that I can stay close to him and so that I can stay strong. So maintenance is the care, support, or upkeep of something and all of us are familiar with this one. You have appliances around the home that they need maintenance. You have to keep them up. You have cars that are either under warranty or not, but you have to keep them up. And so maintenance spiritually is no different. We must maintain our spirits through discipline, through spiritual disciplines. And then exercise, of course, is a process or activity carried out for a specific purpose, especially one concerned with the specified area or skill. If you have this PowerPoint, go on and make some notes on uh, alongside these key terms. If you don't have the PowerPoint, take a picture of these key terms. Because when we talk about spiritual maintenance, this is what we're talking about. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, in different translations, it reads, train yourself for godliness. Train yourself to be godly, which is my favorite. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now you will notice there is a part that God does and there is a part we must do. Minister April preached that um, not long ago, do your part. When we talk about spiritual discipline, we're not talking about the part that God does. We're talking about what we intentionally do in order to stay strong and committed to him. This is what we have to do. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's, he's done his part. Jesus died and was resurrected for us. The Holy Spirit came and indwells us. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to strengthen us to do our part. Somebody type, do your part. The value of such spiritual exercise is seen in 1 Timothy 4, 8, the next verse. It says, godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So godliness is profitable, amen? It pays to do the right thing. It pays to be upright. No one is perfect. No, not at all. But it pays to be upright. Oh, it pays. It pays to do the right thing, even when it's not popular. It pays to do the right thing when it could be so easy to do something else, especially, you know, nobody's looking. I could just do this or that but it pays to do the right thing. And guess what? Here's, here's the other part. It pays to do the wrong thing too. Check it out. One is much more costly than the other. Spiritual discipline is any training. Somebody type training. It's any training intended to develop moral character or produce a pattern of behavior. Any training intended to develop moral character or produce a pattern of behavior. Why do we have to go through all this? Because we don't naturally do the right thing. A great chapter for you to study, if you want to study on the flesh, would be Romans chapter 8. Great chapter which really teaches very clearly that the flesh likes to do the opposite of whatever God says. Check it out for yourself. Romans chapter eight in your personal study time, study Romans chapter eight. 
Spiritual discipline is training that corrects, molds, or perfects the mental faculties or moral character. In essence, it's training that upgrades you, right? Because living in the spirit is the highest form of life. Just living by the flesh, no, sir. You need to upgrade because the flesh doesn't always do right. It is a spiritual discipline, watch this, when practiced faithfully and regularly is a habit or regular pattern in your life. Look at this, that repeatedly brings you back to God and opens you up to what God is saying to you. Man, that's delicious. Can I read that again? Let me read that again. A spiritual discipline when practiced faithfully and regularly is a habit or regular pattern in your life that repeatedly brings you back to God and opens you up to what God is saying to you. That's good stuff. Somebody type, that's good stuff. Hallelujah. Repeatedly brings you back to God. That's what you want. Amen. Spiritual disciplines can be described as behaviors that facilitate spiritual growth. They facilitate it. Spiritual disciplines then are spiritual exercises that one engages in habitually, which bring one closer to God and thus become more godly in character and behavior. Character and behavior. So spiritual disciplines allow your character to be built in whatever places that it's weak and strengthens you and causes you to be more godly, even in your behavior, even in your choices. That's what it does. Delicious. All right, and we talked last week about the fact that I use the analogy or example of a car. A car has to be cared for. As soon as you drive it off the lot, it begins to depreciate and you have to keep your oil levels right, the hoses properly cleansed and connected, the belts tight, the tire pressure has to be checked. You have to make sure you have enough coolant or antifreeze and you have to check the air filter. And so God has given us tools called spiritual discipline. Somebody said, get me my toolbox. Get me my toolbox. So the first tool that we're going to start with, of course, tonight is Bible study. It's the word of God. Amen. That's the, everything is built on the word. So when we pray, when we sing, all the other stuff we do is built on this first tool that we call the word of God. All right. So as you begin to discipline yourself, you're going to start by doing so with the word of God, because when you know the word of God and you get it down in your spirit, nice and strong, it will absolutely affect your behavior. All right. So get your Bible and get ready because we're going to turn to each and every one of these passages and take a look at how important the word of God is, how delicious it is, and how it really does shape our moral character. First passage we're going to go to is Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Somebody type that in the chat and somebody type, I got it. When you have it, type, I have it. Romans chapter 10. Now I'll be reading from the King James Version tonight only because we are, have been so used to hearing these in, the, in that translation, but you can look at it in any translation that you desire. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this powerful passage is letting us know that we, we can only really get faith 
from hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God is what causes your faith level to rise. This is so important, amen? This is how faith comes and how you receive it. So you can't aside, apart from the word of God, really gain strong faith because it is the word of God that strengthens our faith and causes us to remain strong. Now, I want you to think of this as eating. The body needs food, healthy food, emphasis on healthy. The body needs healthy food, water, juice to get strong and to be healthy. Without eating, when we go without eating, I'm not talking about fasting, but when we just don't eat right or, you know, or put junk in our body, our body cannot be strong without eating. It takes food for us to continue to survive. In the same manner, our spirit cannot remain strong without the word of God in it. Our spirits need the word of God. Someone uh, asked me and people ask pastors and preachers questions all the time, but someone said to me, do you really have to go to church? And I said, do you have to eat every day? You cannot stay home from church and feed yourself. Many think that's the case and, and, and they are malnourished spiritually. All you got to do is look at them and you can see it. They're malnourished. Because if, if you could feed yourself at home, God would have never created the church and he would have never given the fivefold ministry gifts to govern it. Every believer needs a pastor that will preach the word of God to them and get them strong. All right, that's our first one. Now let's turn to our second passage, which is 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 15, I'll be reading from the King James Version. So this, this lesson tonight is, is very fundamentally sound, fundamentally sound, because when life gets tough and things get to going, it's, it's having a solid foundation that will cause you to stand. You've, you've got to be clear about what you know about God and believe of him. You've got to be clear. Second Timothy chapter two and verse number 15. It says, study, study, somebody, somebody type study. Amen, not read, not read the word, study the word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed Rightly dividing the word of truth. Somebody type study. So studying the word of God is not just for the preacher because they have to get up and give a sermon. Studying the word of God is the responsibility of believers. Somebody type, I'm a believer. I accepted Jesus Christ into my life as my Lord and Savior. I am a believer. Let me read it to you in the New Living Translation, which is one of the uh, one of my most favorite new ones. Amen. But it says, "Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, and who it correctly explains the Word of Truth." That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. So, you know, bottom line, when we don't know the word of God, we can misrepresent him. I've seen people do it all the time. I watch people sometimes call themselves quoting a scripture and that scripture is not even in the word of God. I heard a lady get up one time. She said, the Bible says, if you take one step, God will take two. And I'm sitting there saying that, tell us where that's located because that ain't in there. That's not in the Bible. It doesn't tell us that. You take one step, he'll take two. He has taken all the steps he's going to take 
And he told us it is finished. God's not taking any more steps. He has laid out a plan and laid out a system called salvation for anyone who wants to believe in him and have a relationship with him. He's not taking any more steps. Jesus hung his head and said, it is finished. So it's stuff like that where people take, you know, sayings that they've heard for years and you try to turn it into a scripture. That's embarrassing because in the day and age we live, people can Google it right while you're speaking and say, that ain't in there, that's wrong. She's not well prepared or he's not well prepared. All right. So you want to study. And, and let me say this. Studying the word of God is not just for the preacher. Please, 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 please. That's like saying only preachers should eat. We should starve and the preacher should eat. That's what that's saying. And that's not what the word of God says. Amen. Somebody type amen. All right. The next one, oh my God, Psalm 119 is, huh, it is amazing. It is one of my favorite, most favorite um, passages in the word of God. The whole chapter is delicious. And you'll find as you're turning to it, you'll find that Psalm 119 is just powerful. I mean, it taught, it makes the value of the word of God very clear. You understand what I'm saying? It makes it very clear. Psalm 119 actually has 176 verses. Okay, 176 verses. One, um, there are 22 stanzas, one for each successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And one of the eight verses within each stanza begins with the Hebrew letter named in its heading. It's amazing. It, Psalm 119 is an amazing piece of work. If you ever get a chance now, sometimes people will ask me, what do I study when I'm by myself? Romans chapter eight, but also you gotta, gotta study Psalm 119, the whole chapter because it really puts the value and emphasis of the word of God. It just makes it clear, right? Look at verse 11. That's our verse. It says, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word. Hold on. Hold on. Let, let's open this up now. Watch this. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? that I might not sin against thee. Having the word of God in your heart is like being vaccinated for COVID. It's like having a flu shot. It's like being vaccinated against certain diseases, polio. and uh, Because what happens when the word of God gets in your heart, it just makes you want to do right. It makes you want to do right. It's so powerful. Oh my God. Someone said, well, how does that work? It, it's because when the word of God is in your heart, it molds and shapes your character. It uh, impacts and influences your decisions. It's just so good for you. And so studying the word of God is like taking a vaccine every day against sin and wrongdoing. Word of God will save your life. Oh my God, it'll save your life. So Psalm 119, as I said, is very extensive, 176 verses. But this one I pulled out because I wanted you to see the attitude of David's heart. David, King David was known as a man after God's own heart. God loved him so because when he would do wrong, he would never end up in that same problem again. When he repented and changed, he really repented and changed. So that's why he's known as a man after God's own heart. And here you hear him saying, thy word have I put in my heart that I might not sin against you. I don't. He's saying, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to sin against you. Let me read it in the New Living Translation. 
pretty close, pretty, very close. Those of you who took my translations course, listen to it. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that's a, a real literal interpretation there. So pretty much uh, very similar, but thy word have I hid in my heart. I put your word in my heart so I don't end up sinning against you. And you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you walk with the Lord, the longer the relationship goes, the more beautiful you see him to be and the more you love him and never want to hurt him. It's such a beautiful thing. The longer you walk with him, you don't stop doing wrong because you're afraid of going to hell or afraid of the consequences. You get to a point where you love God so much that you just don't want to hurt him. Amen. All right. So please, please, when you get a chance in your personal study time, study. In fact, let's go through for a minute and just pick a few more of them out. Is that all right? Somebody let me know. Type a six in the chat if it's okay. If we just peruse through Psalm 119 for a minute and just look at all the goodies. And there are a lot of them. A hundred and... 76 verses. All right. So I'm going to start right here at um, verse number two. We're in Psalm, we're in Psalm chapter 119, everybody. Verse number two says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and they that seek him with the whole heart. My God. <laughs> blessed are they. Now the word blessed can be translated happy. Did you know that? That's one translation of, of the word blessed. Happy are they who keep his testimonies and they that seek him with the whole heart. Delicious, absolutely delicious. And I like verse five where the psalmist says, oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. David, David is kind of crying out saying, I wish I was programmed like a robot to do what you tell me. Because he realizes, like we've come to realize, the flesh don't want to do right. And it is an effort sometimes. Now, sometimes, you know, we're asked to do things and it's not that difficult, but there are some times where the Lord requires something of us and it is hard as I don't know what to do the right thing. Am I telling the truth? Just put some hand claps in the chat, a high five, a heart, something. If I just told the truth, sometimes it's just hard to do the right thing. Lord Jesus, you, you want to in your heart, but you're in the battle of your life because your flesh wants to do something else. And you said, Lord Jesus, help me right here. Help me, help me, help me, right? Oh yeah, I've been there. I know you've been there too. Look at verse nine. I think this is so powerful for young people. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? How shall a young man stay clean? Especially in the, and, and we could say young woman as well. How do they stay clean? By taking heed. Let me mess with that for a minute. Watch this. By taking heed. What does that mean? Well, when we talk about taking heed, we're talking about accepting advice. And you know, like I do, that sometimes young people, they don't want to hear what older people have to say. They don't want to heed the advice that you're giving them. But the scripture tells us how, where Withal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word, by listening, by paying attention, because there's so much in life to get snared upon and snared in and with that if you take heed at a young age, here, let me read it in the New Living Translation. Again, I'm, uh, this is Psalm 119, verse 9. It says, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word, period. By obeying your word. By obeying your word. 
somebody type by obeying your word. There, you know, um, we live in an age where people really want all these new and deep revelations and they want you to be all fancy and, you know, but here's the truth. Live, live fundamentally sound. Because before you try to go into the depths of things, you've got to be fundamentally sound. And this is letting us know that a young person can stay pure. Why? By obeying your word. Not by how many concerts they've been to, not according to who lays hands on them, but just keep the word and you'll stay pure. Somebody type, don't make it hard. Somebody type, don't make it hard. Just do what the word says, right? You'll get great results. All right, now we got to run over to Psalm chapter one. Oh my God, this is one of my favorites. I just like it all, but Psalm chapter number one has been my friend for a long, long, long time. It is so clear. Six little verses, but they pack a punch. I mean, they, they're powerful. They're very powerful. So let's start at verse one, and I'll be reading in the King James Version. There's only six little uh, verses of chapter one, but I'm going to read all of it. Like Romy would tell me, read all of it, Pastor. All right. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. These are all the different behavior patterns that the, that the word is saying. Blessed is the man that doesn't partake of these. He's not entangled in it. He's not walking in it. It says, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth, sitteth, excuse me, in the seat of the scornful. But, somebody say but, somebody type but, verse two says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And we're one of the uh, spiritual disciplines is meditation. And uh, Minister Donna is going to uh, teach you on that, the discipline of meditation. But Bible says that he, this man's delight is in the word of God, so much so that he meditates on it night and day. In other words, meditates, he keeps the word of God on his mind. And why would he do that? He keeps it on his mind to do it. Hallelujah. All right. So we're at that part. And in his law doth he meditate night and day. Now, verse three, this passage takes a shift and it begins to describe the benefits and the consequences for being a person that loves the word of God and meditates on it and gives it a high priority or place in their, in their life. Look at it. Verse three. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Stop. And pause right there before I go any further. He's going to be like a tree. He is, he is compared to a tree. Trees are the most one of the most durable things on the planet. When you plant a tree, especially when it takes root very well and it begins to spring up, it's very strong, it's durable, it's stable, it's not moving anywhere, it's very hard. It takes a serious storm to lift the tree out of the ground. And it does happen, right? But not every day. And so he is likened unto a tree planted by the rivers of water. What does that mean? Not only is he stable, solid, and firm, but he's planted or located next to provision. Mm, mm, mm. Rivers of water, not a lake, not a little stream, but a flowing river, a constant fresh supply of provision and resources. I'm about to need an usher because I'm about to pass out. That's so powerful. We, we're talk, We're describing the man or the woman who meditates in the word of God. They'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now here's the other part that's so delicious. That bringing forth his fruit in his season. Stop, what are you talking about? His fruit, his season. That means that 
you're going to end up being who God says you are in the perfect timing of his will for your life. Excuse me. Ooh, I've walked this thing out. That's why I'm so excited. See, I'm excited because I know this works for real. This ain't just, this is not just words. This is life when applied. Ooh, somebody type that. This is life when applied. Please, Paula Casey, get that for me, Danielle. This is life when applied. Mm -mm -mm. I can stop right there. When the word of God is applied to our lives, it gives us life. So you're going to bring forth your fruit, meaning you don't have to be like anybody else. You don't have to try to be anybody else. You can be yourself and bring forth your fruit in your season. Because what happens when you put God first in time, you're going to end up fulfilled. You're going to end up becoming who he says you are. You're going to end up blessed, highly favored. All things are going to work together for your good. You're going to be the head and not the tail. You're going to end up being more than a conqueror. You're going to end up being blessed coming in, blessed going out. Listen, obedience does all that. And that's the life of this man or this woman who has put their faith in the Lord. Then it says his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. His leaf, his efforts shall not wither, shall not be in vain, shall be effective and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What more guarantee do we need to follow him? I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, I was in the 10th grade in high school and people laughed. Oh my goodness. I got called all kind of little church girls and, you know, holy roly that way. Yeah, they definitely called me holy roly and, you know, all those kind of names because they didn't understand the value of what I was working with. And to work with it at such an early age, it ended up benefiting my life because it impacted everything I did from then on. It impacted my choices. Even when I met my husband, it, it impacted whether or not I opened up to him as a person because the Holy Ghost gave me the discernment to say, this is a husbandman. He's not just a man or male. He's a husbandman, a family man. So the, the word of God began to impact me and benefit me from age 15 forward. So my leaf didn't wither and whatsoever I did prospered. I came from nothing to being now a, a part owner of a mall. Come on, somebody. That sounds like a fairy tale. But literally, it's being described right here in Psalm chapter one. Then this powerful chapter goes on to contrast and compare the godly with the ungodly. Let's look at it. Verse number four says the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. In other words, when you live an ungodly life, you can be uprooted and blown away by the least little thing. Just completely fall apart by whatever life throws at you. But when you're planted like a tree, life will throw what it has at you and you will stand. You'll be like the man who built his house on the rock and the winds came and the storms came. They're gonna come. They're going, somebody type, they're going to come. If you are alive and human, they're going to come, but you don't have to be thrown by them. You don't have to fall apart like everybody else and life just tear you up. When you're standing on the word of God, you will find strength, love, support, encouragement, edification, come on, transformation. You just win. Somebody type, I just win. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. It's the truth. 
because we're more than conquerors. But look at verse five. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. This chapter, again, which is one of my favorites, it describes the life of somebody who puts the word of God first and has a priority. This is someone who the word of God has a pri is a priority in their lives. And look at the benefits. Good, good, good mother. This is just amazing. All right, let's go now to Matthew chapter four and verse four. Is this blessing you? If it is, type blessed. Type the word blessed. If it's not helping you at all, just type not helping me at all. But if this is really helping you and blessing you, just type the word blessed. All righty, so Matthew chapter four, and we're looking at verse number four. Actually, let's read all of it. I'm, we're going to read, this is chapter four. We're going to read verses one through four. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when, he, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these uh, stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <clears throat> There's so much in this passage. I'm trying, I'm trying not to preach or get <laughs> carried away. But the first few verses show us that when the enemy comes, he always comes for your soft spot. I preached on that a few years ago. What is your soft spot? So Jesus, in, in this passage, Jesus has fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And of course he's hungry. And so what does the devil tempt him with? Something to eat. <laughs> if thou be the son of God. Make, uh, you know, command these stones be made bread. In other words, make something that you can eat real quick. Well, that wasn't what the will of God was. He was fasting and praying because the spirit of the Lord led him there. But the devil's trying to break the fast and cause Jesus to get in disobedience. But verse four, Jesus had an answer for him. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Because out of we know that out of the mouth of God comes wisdom, knowledge, understanding. The devil was trying to trip him up. And he does the same thing to us. He will always tap into your weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and the things that you thirst for. My God, I'm gonna preach that one day. Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. Wasn't talking about water. He thirsted for the presence of God again, for the righteousness that he was used to because he was wrapped in sin. He thirsts to be restored back to his father. You got to watch what you thirst for. Somebody type, I thirst. You have to watch what you thirst for. And so here Jesus is hungry. Of course, he's going to offer him something to eat, but Jesus is letting him know that bread is not the only thing I need. I also need the word of God. I need to know what God says. I need to know where God stands on different issues. I need to know what I'm dealing with. Amen. And so it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, we can't afford to fill our bodies up and never fill our spirits. Got to keep them both healthy. Have to keep, I'm doing the beginning of 2024, the whole first quarter, I'm going to deal with health because that all to call Sunday, I didn't know there was that much sickness in the house. I, I understood after the Lord led me the direction he did. Why? Because with all that sickness, it, you can't focus on those uh, spiritual things when your body's hurting. And so I said, we really need to minister on physical health because a lot of folks are not taking care of themselves 
and not because they don't want to. Some of them don't know what's what's the best thing to do, right? But anyway, that was a that was way too much sickness for me, Sunday. I said we got to we got to address this. Get people healthy because it's not enough to be healthy spiritually. You must take care of your temple. You are responsible for taking care of your body. You are. All right. So Joshua 1 8 is our last one for tonight. Turn there with me. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8, another very exciting passage. Ooh. And I guess, you know what? Let me do this. Instead of just reading that verse, I think we should read up to it. Joshua, let's just go to Joshua chapter one. And I'm going to read verses one through eight. Okay. Because that way it'll put it in context. Instead of just pulling out the one scripture. Okay. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man, mm, look at this, y'all. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Somebody just uh, type that, please. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Lord, what a promise. What a promise. What a promise. Verse six, be strong and of a good courage for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Mm, yeah, let me pick with that for a second. Please let me. Can I can I pick with it, y'all? Before I go any further, I want you to see this. The Lord is telling them at the end of verse seven, part B, not to turn from his commandments, not to the right or to the left, meaning don't compromise. Sometimes we want to compromise and try to fit in and try to be accepted. Mm -mm. He says, don't turn from it for the to the right or the left. Why? that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So, you, so the, the only way to prosper is to do what he said. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Just do what he, do what he said, right? I want you to see that. Now let's go to verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Remember I said, don't talk, but speak. It shall not depart out of thy mouth. In other words, speak it declare it. Amen. Put it in the atmosphere, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Ah, is that in your Bible? You can close the case right there. It is up to us whether we have good success or not. It is up to us because as you see right there, the Lord gave him a recipe for success. Do you see that? He just gave him the recipe. So what's that say to us? Do what he says. Somebody type do what he says. Somebody type do what he says. 
Somebody just type, do what he says. It, it really is that simple. People don't want to believe that, but it's that simple. It really is. Do what he says. Now, I'm going to share with you. I got one more passage I want to give you before we close out tonight. And that's in John chapter 2. The Gospel of John chapter 2 and verse 5. This wasn't in your notes tonight, but I want to share it. Go to John chapter 2, verse number 5. This was Jesus. Um, and this was him performing his first miracle. Let's start at verse one, one through five. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no more wine. And Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus was, what he was saying to her was, it's too early. I'm not supposed to start doing miracles yet. It's not the time. See, in addition to knowing the will of God, you must get the timing of God. Because you could be doing what you're supposed to do, but too early or too late. So Jesus is trying to let her know, wait, well, man, it's too early. So verse five, his mother, uh, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus, no, no, no. Verse five, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. All right, that's the key to success in life. I grabbed that nugget years ago. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Somebody type, do it. Just do what he says, period. End of conversation, period. All right. Now, I want to share this with you. Um, we're talking tonight about studying the word of God. And that may be something that you honestly say, you know what? I'm not good at it. I don't know where to start. Well, if you go to our website, all right, this is on the home page. You will see a drop down under Bible study. If you go, it says register for the path, but if you go to the next drop down, it says past classes. There is a whole course there. I think it's seven uh, videos on how to study the Bible. So again, this is something you can do in your own personal study time, right? Go in there and take those classes so you can learn how to study the Bible at home when you're not in a, uh, a, a class like this, a formal class, okay? So take a picture of this slide so you can go back and look for it. That course, How to Study the Bible is right there. You can pull it up anytime. This is the link to get to it, or you can go right here. Here's your homework. You said, we got homework, yep. Make a prayer schedule for yourself. Decide what time you will pray daily at the beginning and end of the day. That was, um, that's going to be uh, one, the first home assignment you have. Start a prayer schedule. Make sure you have liked and shared this lesson tonight. I know it was a blessing to you. So go on and like and share so we can get our 100 likes and 100 shares. Father, we thank you for this class tonight. As always, your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. We're so grateful to be connected to you. Now let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Continue to keep us in the center of your will. Amen. See you at Old Fest. It's going to be amazing. See you there.